let's uh, let's call to order the regular business meeting for the Board of Education for Monday, January 23rd to order if I could ask everyone to please stand and recite the Pledge of Allegiance. So we know for the record, Jim Batson is out this evening. Um, our agenda, we will, um, actually I have nothing uh, to say, so that is my president's report. Um, we will have updates from our school board representatives. Um, we have a rather lengthy superintendent's report covering a lot of um, important issues. We'll open up for public comment, um, we'll review and approve, we've actually reviewed, we'll approve the consent bill agenda. Um, brief updates from program and personnel and You'll be doing that. Right? I'll do that. Okay. I'll sort of make that notation change. And then uh, facilities and finance. Uh, we can just kind of open that up when, uh, without Jim here. Alex is going to just guide okay, us. Uh, no property, oh. correct? No property. See it all, Karen? Nope. No see it all, no IASB. We will have an executive session today. We're going to, um, first of all, let me just uh, hold everybody here briefly. The closed session minutes, if anybody seen any need to. Um, Session. No. All right, if not, we'll move that up into the consent vote agenda and we can approve it with that. Um, those will then remain closed. Um, we have uh, two things to discuss then in the executive session. One relates to um, individual students, um, 5 ILCS 120 slash 2C10. And then we're also going to discuss employment of employees, 5 ILCS 120 slash 2C1. Okay? No votes after either. All right, so let's we go back. Yeah, no president's update, so let's um, have our update from school. Oh, yeah. Okay, uh, before we begin tonight, I um, have some unfortunate news to share. Um, I'd like to take a moment of silence. We lost one of our um, teaching faculty in the district over the holiday, and we'd like to take a moment of silence in our behalf. So please join me in a moment of silence for our friend and colleague, Sheila Russell Frederick, who passed away earlier this month. Sheila was a special services teacher at VHHS. She fought a courageous three-year battle with cancer and was an inspiration to us all. Sheila will be dearly missed, and her thoughts and prayers are with Sheila's husband, Bob, and her entire family. Now let's take a moment of silence. Thank you. Okay, so school board update. Who would like to go first? Yeah. So it's just me today, but um, so at LHS we've been doing a lot of things since uh, we got back from break. So to begin, um, one of our sociology teachers, Mr. Voss, um, his class at LHS is launching a project uh, to raise awareness of sexual assault. So they're going to be starting Blue Ribbon Week uh, to parallel Red and Yellow Ribbon Weeks, uh, which is going to occur in the spring. The intention is to raise awareness of sexual assault and to uh, destigmatize uh, reporting sexual assault. Additionally, uh, we want to congratulate the ILMEA Allstate Ensembles. So we have Allison Goldman, Zach Pearson, Philip Nauman, and Melissa Manich from LHS. It's an extremely high distinction for musicians, and we're really proud to have them represent us. Um, Daniel, who's not here, and I went to a um, model UN trip at Columbia University um, two weeks ago, two weekends ago. He was in Caesars Rome that committee, and I was in the Seneca Falls Convention, which was an incredible experience. It was 60 degrees in New York the first day, so that was really cool. <laughs> but it was also awesome um, being in those committees, being in New York, um, getting to explore the city, but also discussing those issues. Um, additionally, uh, we have a club at LHS called Advocates for Gender Equality, and this past weekend, 30 members from the club attended the Women's March in Chicago. So it was awesome having such a large LHS population there, seeing their signs, and um, just seeing all of them there together. Um, additionally, two weekends ago, seven LHS students attended the Severn Goodman Teen Institute for Prevention and Leadership with our Health and Wellness Coordinator, Dr. Nelson 
talking to them, they said that it was an incredible group of people and that it was one of the best weekends of their lives, so that's a really cool experience. Um, additionally, our dance team qualified for state this past weekend. They got third place at state last year and second place two years ago, so we're super excited to see how they do this year after um, an awesome season. Um, next, Diversity Week is coming up soon at LHS. We are beginning to celebrate that uh, week this year thanks to um, Dr. Nelson, again, our health and wellness prevention health wellness prevention coordinator uh, starting that and an LHS committee composed of students is currently working to pick out films that showcase diversity for a diversity film festival which is um, pretty cool and then finally our turnabout assembly theme is Libertyville's Got Talent which is super cool and being on student council I've gotten to see a lot of the talent auditions which are incredible I didn't even know LHS had this much uh, this variety of talent so we've had an opera singer, uh, many student bands, members of the fencing team face off. We've had Laura Zhang, our very own Olympian. Um, we've had a student perform a violin pop song on a loop, which is really cool. And we're also even having teachers with talents juggle and throw a baton that's going to be lit, lit on fire. That's insane, kind of. Um, and then finally, we have some LHS alum that we're hoping to be, will be participating, such as Flippa Sue from the Hamilton production in New York. So we're hoping that she can um, video in and just give a quick little message for um, LHS. And we're also going to have the alumni band called Sneezy um, participate in the assembly. So, yeah. Hi. So at Vernon Hills High School, we also have um, some people who have qualified for Allstate. So the 2017 conference will also take place in Peoria. And we have people from choir, band, and orchestra. So the people that qualified are Drake DePore for the tuba, CC Gao for flute, Ethan Xiao, Adam Lee, Calvin Yoon, Bob Black, Jillian Bose, Emily Carrito, Kelsey Carrito, and Spencer Moffitt. And for student activities, we have student council with an upcoming blood drive, and we're hoping to get 100 pints of blood. So we've been seeing posters and student council members going around the school motivating people to sign up for this. And um, we also have turnabout coming up, coming up on February 25th, and we're really excited to see how this will turn out since it is our first time as well with turnabout. And student council is planning a kickball tournament in the next couple weeks to raise money for um, COVE and also this. And for first class, we actually had a lesson before winter break, and it was hashtag VH give acceptance. And basically, all the clubs and everyone in school came together after watching this video to pledge kind of as a community to be respectful, kind, and accepting of each other. So we thought this was a really cool message to promote at Burton Hills. And also, we have some for our fine arts. So we've been doing a lot of as you can see, today we actually have a choir concert, if you didn't notice all the people downstairs. But um, our Cougar Art Support team donated proceeds from last evening's holiday concert, totaling over $1,600 to the Vernon Township Food Pantry. And in addition, the concert goers also donated non-perishable food items at the door. And the concert was definitely a success with nearly sold out performances and the impact of the families in Vernon Hills will experience as a result of the cast generous giving is fantastic. And thank you to everyone who contributed to this. Uh, continuing on with some fine arts news, um, nearly 50 students, staff, alumni, and uh, parents in the Vernon Hills High School community uh, joined the Backlight Theater Company for the Ghost Like Project in the Studio Theater. And uh, with this project, um, the theater community may, will make a pledge to stand for and protect the values of inclusion, participation, compassion for everyone, regardless of race, class, religion, country of origin, immigration status, age, and a variety of other issues. Um, and in this um, event, there's more than 500 organizations from all 50 states and the District of Columbia who are going to be who participated in this event. Um, then news for clubs. Um, with the second semester, uh, the academic clubs, such as in science, the math, and the business fields, are, are taking action in their competitions. Um, first off, Academic Bowl, or Scholastic Bowl, has a 4-3 record against the very grueling CSL competition, um, which uh, has some very, very strong talents that we are taking up that challenge for. Um, additionally, Math Team has its regional competition on February 25th, and the Wise Science Team also competes at regionals on February 11th. So. We'll report back uh, with that for some more news in the future. Um, this weekend, the Future Business Leaders of America Northern Area Conference was held 
um, at Warren Township High School, and we had some great success uh, for our students, just as we always do with FBLA. Um, junior, uh, the, our junior, Hiba Ahmed, was elected the Northern Area Treasurer of the entire area um, for FBLA. And additionally, in the competition, eight people received first place medals, uh, which is a great honor for our school, with 85 people competing, and a variety of other medals ranging from second uh, down to many more places earned by uh, the 85 kids in our school. And of course, we look forward to their continued success at state and at nationals if we have seen any trend with our uh, FBLA team. Um, in sports, our varsity boys bowling team finished first place in the CSL conference, which is really exciting news, uh, especially uh, the way I've really been making the CSL division seem like this very, very fearful thing. But uh, we're really proud of that. Our boys bowling team did a great job this season. Um, also, the Palms team, um, both, both Palms teams con uh, competed at the sectional competition this weekend and are moving on to state, which is very exciting for them as well. And the very exciting news uh, with basketball is the intramural season, which has finally come to uh, an end um, with the Trailblazers uh, winning with only one loss on their entire season record. Um, so this was our greatest intramural uh, season ever, ever in Niels High School with 18 total teams. So of course it was a cool honor for them. And they get to challenge the teacher basketball team uh, which is always a sight to see, especially since uh, a bunch of these teachers have been practicing every um, morning for, for many weeks. Practicing, that's a loose term. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, 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 a lot of it's talking. <laughs> but like, yeah, yeah. Some it's of very them. intense with our slide seat in early bird class. That's right, that's right. <laughs> Tuesday, Thursday morning. Yeah, so it's going to be funny seeing our calculus teacher run around the field, um, <laughs> among others. So yeah, we get to, uh, all the students get a chance to see that in our next assembly next month. And, and then some more uh, news in basketball. Our boys basketball team won uh, one of their biggest wins in years with an uplifting victory against Highland Park, which was tied for first in the conference. Uh, so this, team was a, uh, this win was a great moral boost um, as we head into the playoff season. Uh, similarly, our girls basketball team sh has been sharing a similar positive outlook with a six to one season record. So um, the uh, sports um, at Vernon Hills are staying strong and we're excited for the season and the next one too. Great, nice job. And it seems like you guys are in the paper more than I am. <laughs> <laughs> and as Trump, let's say, Trump said to Obama, and I, I got to learn from you what, whatever you're doing to keep your popularity up. Because you're working better for you than it's working for me. <clears throat> All right, good job. Um, superintendent's report. We got a long list of good things. Okay, first of all, uh, more good news and uh, it bears repeating. And as Pat mentioned, this. Um, these two are in the newspaper quite often recently, but let's say again that VHHS seniors Aparataja Adaraju and Akash Seti were named to the 2016-17 Daily Herald Leadership Team, and LHS seniors Manal Ahmed and Grace Hurley were named honorable mention. So it's quite, thank you. Yeah, thank you. January 7, five D128 Special Olympians qualified for the state winter games after winning the gold at the area games at Lamb's Farm. Our five qualifiers are Mallory Marvin, Nathan Ferrara, Eric Catterlin, Joseph Mahler, and Austin Yosen Hans. The winter games will be held February 7th to 9th in Galena. Also in Special Olympics news, the D128 Special Olympics basketball team finished second in its division two weekends ago at the area basketball tournament. After beating District 203 from Naperville in the semifinals, the team fell to the Hersey Huskies in a very competitive, hard-fought championship game, earning a silver medal for the day. Team members are Joseph Mahler, Nathan Ferrara, Mason Reyes, Krista Rose, Alexa Donato, Mallory Marvin, Sean Karanen, Austin uh, Josenhans, Johnny O'Connor, and Eric Hatterlin. The LHS Jazz Ensembles and Combos, uh, conducted by Tim Barkley and Matt Karnstedt, gave outstanding performances at the North Shore Jazz Festival at Glenbrook South High School this past weekend. Both ensembles earned Division I superior ratings. That is the best of the best if you're not a fine arts uh, folk. Um, the District 128 Foundation for Learning continued its mission of enhancing learning in Community High School District 128 by awarding 17 innovation grants totaling $22,250 to Libertyville High School and Vernon Hills High School teachers on December 22nd. The 2016-17 grant winners were announced and celebrated at a luncheon held at uh, District 128 Administrative Office. This year's grants brought the number 
of grants awarded by the foundation since 2008 to 113 and the total dollars funded to 169,000. The grant winners were joined at the presentation by members of the Foundation for Learning Board of Trustees, the D128 administration, and the Foundation Grant Review Committee. This year's innovation grant recipients are Kim Jansen, Simone Oswey, Alyssa Gong, Rebecca Garcia, Tammy Black, Maggie Nicholson, Ashley Bell, Amanda Carroll, Sherry Rooks, Mike Bush, Mary Clark, Mark Procise, Monica Tolba, Jennifer Getch, Karen Kim, Chris Wolf, Teresa Elmore, Brandon Waters, Jane Wenzel, Pete Dawson, Mike Cook, Jason Rush, Josh Ravenscraft, Matt Karnstead, Katie Bashar, Shannon Ednire, and Jay Walgren. Founded in 2007, the Foundation for Learning was established to enhance and enrich the instructional program in District 128 by obtaining resources through community partnerships. So first, thank the Foundation for their continued work on the behalf of the district uh, in enriching and enhancing, and second, congratulations to all of the uh, Innovation Grant recipients. Legendary LHS wrestling coach Dale Eggert has been selected by the Illinois Wrestling Coaches and Officials Association, the IWCOA, as one of seven outstanding contributors to Illinois wrestling who will receive the IWCOA 2017 Lifetime Service Award. Dale will be honored and celebrated at the 2017 Hall of Fame Induction and Lifetime Service Award Banquet on Saturday, April 26th in Countryside. LHS soccer coach Andy Bitta was inducted into the Lake County High School Sports Hall of Fame on January 21st at the College of Lake County. VHHS was a recipient of a Bob's Discount Furniture Random Acts of Kindness um, donation uh, today. Hmm. This morning at the new Bob's location in Vernon Hills. That was actually Sunday. But Sunday, okay. VHHS principal received a check for $2,500 as part of the store's outreach program designed to support nonprofit hmm. organizations in each area in which they open a new store. So, John, that's pretty exciting. Good news. It's been great. Great news. Thanks to Bob's. VHHS Choir Director Jeremy Little will present two sessions at the 2017 Illinois All-State Music Convention on Friday, January 27th. Little sessions are Wisdom Begins in Wonder, Asking Thoughtful Questions, Creating Meaningful Conversations, and Our Product is a Certain Kind of Kid, a comprehensive musical partnership through performance overview, uh, musicianship through performance overview. So congratulations to Jeremy, continues to do an outstanding job for us and contributes to the field as large as so many of our staff members do. So um, unless somebody else has something to add on the good news, that concludes our good news uh, tonight. Um, second, uh, as the board is aware, and we certainly want to make the community aware, we talked at our committee meetings on two weeks ago on Monday, um, we uh, have worked with the board uh, authorized this summer at our recommendation a comprehensive demographic study of the district. For those that are not uh, familiar with that, that demographic study is designed to take in a number of uh, outputs, inputs, uh, and give us some predictions on what our enrollment will be like in the future. Uh, typically, um, those uh, demographic studies go out 10 years and then you update them uh, during the course of the study, given some of the uh, proposed developments across the entire district, uh, we'll likely be updating that on a year-by-year -year basis. Uh, we work with Dr. John Casarda, who is the demographer in the Midwest. Uh, Dr. Casarda works with uh, districts everywhere um, in, in terms of these types of studies, uh, factors in, uh, again, a, a number of things in making those predictions. Uh, many of the local uh, districts, including some of our feeder districts, also use uh, Dr. Casarda, and we often do these reports in conjunction with each other. Um, we will certainly do that uh, with updates uh, moving forward. So uh, it is a very lengthy and very detailed report, probably you know, an inch, inch and a half uh, deep. But as we did at the committee meeting, there are two or three of the uh, pertinent slides that we just want to hit as an overview. And then I want to make a couple of specific comments because we've asked him some, um, a very specific question uh, about one of the developments coming into uh, the community. So um, if you guys want to pull up the first slide, Al, if you want to just kind of do an overview and then I'll, I'll finish up with a couple of comments. So the next slide, Peter. 
If you look at projections for Libertyville High School, then we'll take a look at Vernon Hills, and then we'll look at how that impacts the entire district. Um, <coughs> you'll see here, if you look at the bottom line, where it says total and run yourself across there, you'll see in Libertyville that over the first four year period, you'll see a, a decrease of about 133 students in the next four years. And then from that point forward, you see a pretty steady increase uh, for this, con this succeeding six years. So over that 10 year period, there's about a decrease of 4950 students for Libertyville High School. For Vernon Hills High School, that's a little bit different story. If you look at the bottom line again, you'll see that over the next four years, there's going to be approximately 180 student increase in that four years. And then it's going to steadily continue to increase to almost 300 students over the next 10 years. So in a 10 year period, Vernon Hills will go from 1,361 students to 1,656 students. So a pretty significant increase. So the impact on the district, if you go to the next slide, you'll see that um, because of the net growth in Vernon Hills primarily, you have about, uh, in the next four years, you have 48 to 50 students added to the district. And then over that 10 year period, you're gonna have about 350, or excuse me, yes, I'm gonna use my glasses here. About 200, a little less than 250 students added to the district. So remember, as Prentice says, the, the, the bulk of this, the, the major impact is new housing and housing turnover. Uh, younger families buying homes and having school-aged children come to school. So those are the primary factors that contribute to the, the changes in our school enrollment projections. Yeah, District 73 is already, if uh, anybody has you know, been watching the news, District 73 is, has done extensive analysis and planning uh, on how they are already seeing that increase in students, I believe, uh, um, uh, Dr. Nick Brown, the uh, superintendent there. Um, I'm gonna be close on the number here, so don't quote me on it, but they're up about 125 students this year, was, which is significant, students that they didn't know were coming um, this year. And so, um, you know, they're seeing turnover and then they've got some proposed developments uh, in, in Vernon Hills in several locations. Uh, one uh, up at the Melody Farm location up at um, 21 and uh, 60, which will include uh, some condos on development. The Cuneo property uh, is still under discussion for development uh, to put uh, single family homes there um, at some point and a portion of the land there that has been um, purchased from or will be purchased from uh, Loyola University owns the property now. And uh, it's my understanding that they're gonna take any money that they procure from that and use it for ongoing maintenance um, at the facility, uh, at the mansion. Um, and then, uh, of course, in Libertyville, uh, they're doing work on the Bolander Park property. I think I've got that right right now from Winchester. And then there's a proposed development uh, that many people know about as well uh, up on North Butterfield Road. So as these developments, as um, you know, we get more detail on these developments, um, we will ask our demographer to take the inputs from those developments and give us specific numbers. There's one critical thing to point out here, the difference between us and an elementary district, particularly the lower elementary grades, is that if you have 25 third graders show up at a school that you didn't know were coming in the springtime, then you have to come up with a dedicated one dedicated classroom and you have to find a teacher to teach those kids. Uh, until they start rotating, you know, two or three or four classes. At the high school, when a student comes in, the students are spread across seven classes um, through four grades. And so uh, it's much um, easier, if you will, to absorb those kids at the high school because they're coming in and you're spreading them out, uh, you know, among, you know, a much greater field of, of potentials, uh, if you will. So um, with the work uh, or at least the conversation specifically on the, on the development up on Butterfield Road, we asked Dr. Casarda if he could project uh, the number of students that would be produced um, in any given year between 9 and 12, and uh, his projection was 41 students. Now, if you put that together with the elementary grades and that would hold up, 
uh, because I understand that there's been some concern about um, the developer may be under predicting the numbers, but if you took those numbers, we would be, if you took K-12 or just 112, 12 grades, and take our four grades out, and then multiply that times three is about a third of that, then you're looking at, you know, probably 120-ish kids, um, you know, for all of us, K-12. Um, we would have the ability, based on Dr. Cassar's projections, to absorb those students in, uh, at Libertyville High School with not uh, a critical mass uh, moving forward. So uh, that would be um, you know, our projection on that. As some of the other developments come to the fore, for example, if they start to, if they actually start to develop uh, the Cuneo property, then we'll ask Dr. Casarda to do the same kind of allocation. Now Cuneo actually falls into the Vernon Hills area of the district, so we want to see how that fit um, into Vernon Hills. And Melody Farm is developed. We want to see how that uh, fits in um, as well. So we use the Series B projection because that is the kind of the middle projection. So there is, you know, kind of a high projection. There's a low projection, and over time, usually the Series B projection is the most accurate. However, we have the ability to adjust during the course of, let's say, this 10-year window. That looks like, for example, 73 is getting even more students. Uh, coming in and there's going to be more impact at Vernon Hills High School, um, then we would jump to the A projection. Um, and if that became problematic, we would have to ask Dr. Casarda to take a look at that again. Actually, uh, we have another kind of challenge to deal with that uh, we've been dealing with for a little while. Peter, can you pull us up to the next screen in the map of the school district? We have a pointer up here. Peter. Um, I'm not sure. Can you use this guy? Okay, I promise to give it back. You know where to find me, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so where's my pointer at? Okay, is he on? Yeah, we're back. Maybe not working. That's okay, just a piece That's okay. Okay, I'll try and use this as my actual stick. So if you want to put that map back on for me, sure. Thanks. All right, one of the other challenges that our board is aware of that we face that we really want uh, the community. Can you pick that up without a mic, Stuart? Yeah, yes. okay. I'll speak really loud in my ex coach's voice. One of the challenges that we have faced over the last four or five years in this district. Um, to the actual scope and size of the district are detachments. And to do a quick review of detachments, detachment is uh, something that's allowed to be applied for under Illinois law where a subdivision contiguous to a school district or school districts can request and go through a legal process to detach from their current school district or districts and move into another district. Our board is well aware that we went through a detachment process um, three years ago now with the Lancaster subdivision, which is up off of um, Oak Plain Road uh, as you get close to the toll road there. So I can't, I'm short, can't quite get up there, but this is the tollway, so it's inside and it would be up here, the very northern part of our district there. Lancaster was successful in that detachment petition. Here's some solid works. The petitioners fill a petition out, get petition signed uh, with the Regional Office of Education. The Regional Office of Education then sets up a legal hearing process with the Lake County Regional Board of Education trustees, which is an elected board. Essentially, they meet once a month. This is one of the primary things um, that they deal with. So we went through that process. We did a vigorous defense along with the other districts that were involved in this particular detachment. Those districts were Woodland 50, Ingermey, and um, Warren Township High School District 121, Oak Grove District 68, which would have been the affected elementary district, and District 128. After going through several levels of process and appeals, a three-judge appeals court ruled that uh, they had uh, essentially not met the standards that the um, uh, statute set out, but they thought they ought to have the opportunity to go to our two school districts. So, uh, following that, we worked very closely with 
Um, State Senator Melinda Bush and locally here, State Representative Carol Senti, and we rewrote the statute. We worked with legislators, we testified in Springfield, I talked to the governor's chief of staff and his secretary of education, and eventually that legislation passed and in the House and the Senate, and it also uh, was signed by the governor. So, what happened? It does not make detachments impossible to get. However, it clearly lined out the criteria which must be met for a regional board or the courts to grant that detachment. And uh, it was a much more defined version of the previous um, statute um, as a result of the Lancaster uh, decision. So that new law is now in place. We currently have two detachments that are pending. One is Meadow Woods, which is if you go up Oak Plain again, is right across the street, literally, almost, from Lancaster. And they have asked for detachment into our district. Again, the affected other districts are Oak Grove 68, Woodland 50, and Warren 121. The second subdivision that has requested detachment uh, and is, is availing themselves of the process is Daybreak Farms. And I think many of you are, if you've ever gone up River Road, Daybreak Farms is kind of right up River Road before you get to 120, uh, again on the north end of the district. Oak Grove, Woodland, and Warren, and District 128. The status of those two detachments right now is they are on hold in court before the hearing at the Regional Board of Trustees. And the issue that the court is deciding is this. They wanted their detachments to be heard under the old statute, okay, we argued that when those court, when those cases came uh, in front of the regional board, that uh, the new statute applied because they were being heard initially after the new statute was passed. So the court will rule under which set of rules that those detachments um, will be uh, heard under. So we're waiting to hear back on that now, and uh, attorneys for both sides are in court. Now, I received communication prior to the winter holiday from the subdivision called Arbor Vista, which is on the very north end of the district up here past Casey Road, um, right in the top, right beyond the top corner there as you go to um, um, the College of Lake County. Before you turn into College of Lake County, um, Arbor Vista is right up in that area there, so it's just beyond the northeast, northwest part of our border. Who are the districts that would be affected by that? District 70, okay, Libertyville, and again, Woodland and Warren in that neck of the woods. We have not received, uh, although the representative from that group told me that they were going to file and they were going to pursue that to come into our district, they, uh, we have not received uh, kind of the official documents from uh, the Regional Office of Education. So you might be asking yourself, well, why don't we take those places in and why don't we take their tax dollars and you know, we'll, we'll take their kids in and the world is you know, wonderful. Here's the problem. The way the detachment law works is every time a detachment is granted, you have now increased the size of your school district. So once you increase the size of your school district, you have now have more contiguous subdivisions that can then detach. So you create a process in which you built a school district on a set of you know, criteria or a set of assumptions uh, moving forward. And now you either have too many kids or not enough kids uh, moving forward and you have no control over that situation. This is not a locally decided issue. It's a legal process that goes through uh, you know, a hearing process and it can be appealed in court, can go to appeals court and can be taken all the way to the Illinois Supreme Court. It's a different situation than working, let's say, locally on that. So our concern uh, is that uh, as, again, as detachments are granted, then you know, other subdivisions have the opportunity to say, hey, we want, really want our kids to go to 128. To, be, to bring this down to a, kind of the very basic level, they have to meet two criteria. They have to demonstrate that there's an educational benefit okay, to, to detach from one school district into a next school district, and there's a community of interest. You, you can't want to take your subdivision out because you have five Division I basketball players and you want to go to School X. Okay, that's not going to work. And so again, what we did with the new statute is we worked to define what that meant. 
in a much more clear uh, terms. So that's a concern not only for us, but other school districts uh, in the area that we're looking at you know, growth uh, of the district moving forward. Those of you who have been around the district for a long time, down in the south uh, end of the district here, uh, Gross Point twice uh, attempted to detach and come into District uh, 128 and, and probably our elementary school district in that corner of the district where we've got kids going to uh, three different schools. So that's the status uh, at you know this point with detachments. But it becomes, you know, it becomes very um, uh, problematic because we have very little control um, over that scenario. Um, you know, as opposed to you know some of the conversations that might uh, happen locally within the village. So any questions on detachments? So I have I have one. Sure. Um, sure. So going back to the demographic study that we just saw yeah. and we were introduced to uh, a committee two weeks ago, is it fair to say that in that study, I know that we that he took into consideration any possible developments, new housing developments that we just mentioned. Those were all right. considered. Or did they also consider the possibility of detachments? No, okay. because we don't know, and we really have to take those on a, on a one-off. And, and, on, and on the flip side of detachments, you can understand if you're a district that's losing, mm -hmm. that you've built your facilities over the years for X number of kids, and the snowball starts to roll, and you're, you know, you're losing you know, that property tax base, and you're losing the kids that you actually built your facilities for. Uh, it becomes really problematic. You have all kind of capital and resource implications. Yeah, ex exactly. Just like you guys would do. That would be on the opposite side. Right. We built these buildings for right. people based off of projections, and now they're not there. Conversely, you didn't build these buildings for all these people or hire all these people. Now you got to deal with them. Exactly. And as we've worked on the detachments over the last few years, I mean, we've gotten to know our colleague districts pretty well. And, uh, you know, I'll just give a, a shout out to Warren and Hinlin. I mean, their kids are doing, the kids they serve are doing well there. They have a vibrant advanced placement program at Warren because their economy of scale of 4,400 students, you know, is 1,200 students more than we have. They actually offer more advanced placement classes there, and their kids perform uh, very well. That's why we were very disappointed in the Lancaster decision because there was no clear educational benefit for those students leaving Woodland and Warren and coming to Oak Grove in, in, in 128. So that's why we felt like uh, we had to work with our uh, legislators. And, and again, a, sh a shout out to Senator Bush and, and Representative Senti who were willing to listen, uh, take the time to listen, understand the problem, uh, allow us, and allow us to work with council to develop some legislation. And then they worked across the aisle because it ended up um, overwhelming votes in the House and the Senate. Uh, but they were bipartisan, and at the time that bill was passed, just like now, there wasn't a lot of bipartisan work going on. That, that bill was passed at the end of May, um, you know, at the, when they were trying to pass a budget and all of that. So we really appreciate uh, they're willing to work for um, school districts, and it is already had an, uh, an impact other places, um, and hopefully will have an impact with us too. So we'll continue to update uh, you guys. Scott, did that answer your question? Yeah, the only other question I have going south now. Sure. Any updates on the proposed subdivision where it sits today that we would share with Stevenson? Uh, no, actually we have a meeting coming up to meet with the developer. Again, just to bring the community up to speed, there is a proposed development um, up on 45 and uh, Fairway here, Buffalo Grove Road, when you pass the uh, corner there for uh, some homes to be built. Um, as you're probably aware, school districts boundaries were drawn long ago before many subdivisions were ever built. So some subdivisions are built and the kids are split between school districts, hence other parts of the south end of our district. Uh, in that particular subdivision, about two-thirds of the school, uh, two-thirds of that subdivision would go to Stevenson and Lincolnshire 103 and about a third would come to Vernon Hill 73 in 128 Vernon Hills High School um, in that area. So um, we're having conversations, negotiating, if you will, um, with the developers there. The developer would like the school, the schools, uh, the kids that live in that subdivision, <coughs> excuse me, all to be in one school, one elementary district and one high school district. And the board, we concur with that as an administration. The board certainly concurs with that as a. As a, as a governing school board. Um, 
the tricky part is that you know 73 has some enrollment issues. Um, Lincolnshire 103, I believe, has some enrollment issues, and then um, Stevenson after their tight. enrollment after their enrollment dropped down over a five-year period is starting to go back up because houses are starting to turn over uh, from newer um, More of a yeah change. yeah new, they're going through a kind of a classic demographic pattern there so their enrollment is starting to go up um, so they likely have the space uh, for those students so uh, we're talking with the developer and see if you know there's a possibility of some impact fees or, or something else if we were to sign off uh, so to speak for those kids to go to Lincolnshire and um, Stevenson High School uh, for the developer to do some impact fees you know with the district that's never a ton of money uh, impact fees but you know it's a little bit of an offset um, moving forward so we have a meeting coming up on uh, 26th I think if I remember correct uh, with all the parties involved including uh, um, Stevenson and, and um, 103 and 73 and uh, 128 so um, lots of stuff going on right now right. for sure so okay any other questions on that okay let me spend a couple of minutes uh, you're probably reading newspapers uh, hopefully or uh, some news source um, Senate President Cullerton and um, his counterpart um, Minority Leader Christine McRidonio is down in the kind of the Naperville um, area, uh, down in the west, southwest suburbs, uh, have come to a meeting of the minds and their leadership teams on a proposed budget package, um, which for a better, lack of a better term, would be called a grand bargain. And it'd be called a grand bargain because the proposed package has something in it for both sides. Um, it's pretty amazing actually because uh, a week ago they actually had a joint press conference on this or two weeks ago so which did not happen I don't know forever probably um, moving forward but I just want to hit a couple of highlights as we look at all school districts um, you know look forward in municipalities uh, about what could happen or at least the pieces of the package and I'm not going to go into tremendous detail but folks can um, you know look that up for themselves but I'll hit some of the highlights um, in addition, this week, uh, when the legislature came back uh, this week, they filed a series of bills which in essence will be shell bills for bills that will be heard and passed that could be part of the grand bargain. Senator um, President Cullerton and Minority Leader Redonio's position on this is all the bills will have to be passed together in a package so they're not stripped off one at a time and, and pulled apart and we end up in May um, you know where we've been the last couple of years which is with out of budget which has been catastrophic for many things in the state including social services and supports um, for the elderly and, and certainly schools um, as well so um, they are intent on pushing this forward in the Senate now this does not mean that each one of the individual bills that made up the package would not go through committee would not get a thorough screen might not you know could even be you know adapted uh, or altered or edited a bit uh, along the way to get to a position that everyone can support it. I think they're also in agreement that there are some there are some things in here that virtually everyone will not like. You know, Scott might not like this piece, Stephen won't like this piece, but there are other pieces in there that Scott and Stephen would like. So that's the the concept moving forward. So the big hitters in that are uh, property tax freeze. Okay, and uh, what's been proposed is a two-year property tax freeze, which would, in essence, limit um, um, property tax growth at 0%. So we'd essentially get, let's say for the next two years or whenever the legislation's passed, you would essentially get that level of revenue uh, in the future, regardless of what CPI is, you know, regardless of what you know, the levy so was. So the CPI 5% thing out the door. Right, it would still be, yes, it would still, so we go down to uh, 0%. What's um, devil's in the details, as it is with, with all legislation, and so part of that piece is that they're going to have to determine is that zero for everything? Does that include new growth, for example? I don't believe it will at the end of the day, but uh, we'll see you know, how that ferrets its way out. Mandate relief is kind of a back end of that. We have complained for years about more and more unfunded mandates being passed at the state level. So the intention is to give us some, um, you know, mandate relief uh, at the local level and to give us some flexibility working with our local boards, 
uh, to um, actually identify what some of those mandates are. They'll have a list I'm, I'm sure that you know, we can consider uh, in moving forward. Um, revenue enhancements on the other end, uh, part of their conversation is, is, has been um, to increase personal income tax rate uh, initially from 3.75 to 4.95, so that takes us kind of back up to where we were several years ago. Uh, incre increase the corporate income tax from 5.25 to 7 percent. You've probably all heard about st establish a statewide tax on sugar sweetened beverages, you know, and you know, on, kind of on and on and on. Pension reform. Um, several years ago, when the state was going through the large uh, pension uh, pension reform discussion, uh, passed a bill in both houses. Uh, was challenged in court. The Supreme Court said, you know, doesn't meet the standards. Unconstitutional. So. Um, President Cullerton had proposed earlier in that discussion what's called a choice plan. So um, current employees have some choices about what they might do with their pension at the end. They can keep getting their salary increases toward their pensionable earnings. Um, if they give up their, uh, go to a simple, a simple cola instead of a, a compound cola, uh, vice versa. So uh, again, unknown whether that's constitutional and whether they'll get enough support for that. But they are talking about pension reform, uh, again, as part of that. And then school funding reform. Um, our administrative team there is here. There's a group of administrators in the state of which I'm, I'm part of that have been uh, promoting a funding formula that was actually developed by the Alliance. And the Alliance is the Illinois Association of School Business Officials, superintendents, principals, uh, the uh, school board association. Um, uh, and there are five groups uh, that make up the Alliance that's um, called an evidence-based model, and it would base funding on best practices that you're doing in your school district. So, you know, districts that are following best practices out in the field have an opportunity to, you know, be fully funded uh, moving forward, and uh, um, the state, well, to make that work, the state's gonna have to find an additional resource, uh, funding source there, because uh, the legislators have already said they're gonna hold suburban districts harmless meaning that they're not gonna borrow from Peter to pay Paul. So they're not gonna take $3 million, let's say, from 128 uh, and give it to a downstate district because they'll never get that passed. I don't care if you're a Republican or Democrat. If you're gonna give $10 million away in your district, you're not going back the next time in election time, uh, probably. So uh, there's some political reality that goes into that. So there's some other things with the Chicago Pension uh, Fund as part of this that will and help make some of their pension payments and help them get caught up and all that. So uh, I think it'll be must watch TV as, as they really get back to work down the stretch of the spring session and we'll see if we can actually get uh, to a state um, budget agreement. So as we're working on budget assumptions for next year, um, you got the news this year that CPI, um, uh, the government uh, figure for CPI is 2.1, yes? 2.1, which is higher than it's been for a number of years, but as Alex has pointed out, he's worked with Yaz doing some of our projections. What's problematic is um, with that, if you, on one front, um, is that um, if you go to zero percent property tax, uh, you're not gonna take that 2.1 in. On the other side of that, the good news story on the other side of that is with the property tax freeze, you're holding property tax on property taxes you know, level for, um, you know, local communities. So they're gonna have to wrestle through that one um, as well uh, moving forward. So uh, as we always do, we'll keep you updated on those things because they have impacts, but as we do our budget projections, Jazz is gonna have to do two scenarios, and those two scenarios would be run out 0% and then run out, you know, if CPI is 2.1 and there is no property tax freeze this year and they don't end up doing that until next year or it's a year in arrears and then it's gonna be two years. Uh, moving forward. I think uh, property tax freeze has universal support uh, in the state right now, um, given the property tax burden uh, that everyone has. So I think if that's a part of the, that's a part of the package, that's not gonna be a non-starter for, for probably many people or many legislators uh, moving forward. I think that's a pretty realistic way to um, look at it. Right, so, we know. <clears throat> so if they did freeze for two years, is the jumping off point from a tax cap standpoint where you ended up after the freeze? So if they froze for two years, basically, is that what you're saying? I believe so. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So if you came out of that with 1% inflation, then after two years of freeze, you can only increase 1%. Okay. okay. Yeah, I think, I, Pat, I think you're accurate on that. Um, 
it's pulling out my calendar. So any other questions on that? I mean, we're going to watch all of that play out locally, as we always do. Regardless of your political affiliation, I encourage you to talk to your legislators, okay? Whatever your position is, get involved in the process. They need to hear from you. We, we do that, you know, religiously as superintendents um, in terms of uh, talking to them in, in public schools and public education. Uh, and they've been uh, very good. I just uh, attended a Lake County legislators uh, breakfast a week ago Friday. The tremendous turnout from uh, Lake County and North Cliff legislators there. Great conversations about all the possibilities here. And uh, it's kind of a brave new world for uh, the state to figure out, actually figure out how we're going to get ourselves out of the hole in the mess moving forward. It seems to me, uh, after having you know been to Springfield many times over the last decade, that um, it seems to me that there is a growing sense of esprit de corps that we do have to do something, that we just can't continue to do, you know, a patchwork uh, budget and have, you know, $13 million, $13 million you know, deficits that, that that's not sustainable over a period of time. So, um, any other questions about that? Okay, let me pull up my February calendar here. Uh, a couple of dates from the board for Finance 101. Uh, Yaz and Alex have been working on uh, updating all of our information. Um, and uh, let me get my web calendar up here. Okay, uh, a couple of dates for the board to consider because obviously we would like uh, boards to be able, uh, board members to be able to um, certainly attend with us and, and um, prevent and answer any questions. Um, we have the Ed Red Legislative Dinner next Monday, January 30th, just as a shout out and a reminder, if you haven't let Denise know, please do that. Uh, so we're looking at February 6th or February 20th, and we'll have the first one at district office, and then uh, in March and April, I'll work for the village administrators. Uh, we'll do one over at uh, Liberty Village Hall, and we'll do one at Vernon Hills Village Hall. Um, give Mary enough time to get communication out um, on that again. Okay, so um, if you're not sure what works for you tonight, I can send you an email tomorrow. Uh, but we'd like to be able to announce the, the, the date and Mary start doing some back work on communication. Is there school, is there school on 20th? Pardon? Is there school on 20th? Uh, the students are off on the 20th. It's an institute day for us, so we're in, we're in session. I mean, you know that adults are here, so, um, you know, that works for us. So, so, how about you guys? How about the 6th? Let's do that. 6th is probably pretty soon. Okay, 20th? Yeah. I'm in, I'm in on the 20th, as long as we've got a couple other people. Okay, Alex, what for you? Uh, I'm, I'm a little more biased toward the 6th, but I could probably survive the 20th. Right. I can do that. Okay, Scott, any? Uh, to be determined? I'm out that whole week of the 20th. Okay, all right. This is what it so, is. Then you, you, but we got other ones coming yeah, yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, you so. can pick up with us at the other ones. So, you know, I, I don't, listen, I don't want to hold these up. Let's right. get them going. Okay, let's do that. Um, we don't own them. No, so we had like two. Yeah. No, we need a yeah, we need a couple there. So um, I can't tell you till tomorrow. So the twentieth, Pat, better for you. You're I'm good either. Okay. So I'm good. Alex like the six better. I'm going to six. Way more important. Boy, you're out there. Yeah. So Stephen, so maybe you mean you know we'll do a seven o'clock ish thing. Okay. I think it's important at a very high level we go through what you just articulated. Yes in a very concise way to say these are the these are the tangible things that are on that we are scenario planning around. Right. Yeah, we may need to meet once before this thing. Right? Yeah. Well, yeah. let's do the 20th then, and then we've got a little planning time, Alex, if you can make the 20th. Uh, we certainly want uh, you there. And the one thing I neglected to mention is the pension cost shift. So part of that package of the trade-off is the pension cost shift. And what that means is that the, the normal, what the state considers the normal cost of TRS pensions, which is around roughly 6% given the debt load, um, that local districts would begin to pick up for their employees. Now we're hearing, kind of heard last week, that there may be a modification to that only over certain salary levels, which, so we'll have to see how that comes out. But in concept, the local district, this is Madigan's plan from several years ago, um, that we would begin to pick up the piece of those pensions that the state calls a normal cost. Chicago already does that, okay? They pick up the normal cost of their teachers' pensions. So the original plan back in the day, several years ago, 
was to increase that contribution from the district to half a percent a year for 12 years to get to 6%. So a half plus a half plus a half until we got there. And Yaz and I actually you know, ran that scenario out uh, at one point. And then you know, beyond that, once you got to that threshold, then you would pay that 6% on all your TRS employees every year. So I think there'll be some modification from that because that will be um, untenable for some districts that are already struggling uh, financially. And then if you, add the, um, if you add the tax cap on top of that, uh, will it really create kind of a death scenario for, for some school districts? So um, that will be coming up. So February 20th, okay, uh, we'll rock with that one, and I'll be working with um, our new village administrator over at Libertyville and John Calmar over at Vernon Hills to, to set up dates for those two locations um, in March, okay? The, the only thing I will, I will say, and we have several people there that are in the audience, and for anybody who's going to pull up the uh, video on YouTube, um, I encourage you all to come. I encourage you to spread the word about it. Um, we've got some challenges that are coming up as it relates to budget issues. And I think it's important that people understand the situation, understand the facts, because I also believe there's a lot of misinformation that is out there. And I think this will be a great opportunity to understand where are we at, what are we faced with, and what are the decisions that lie ahead for the district and the board and the schools. And, and frankly, for the community and, and the people that live in it. So um, that's my two cents there. Okay, Chris. So, so I've asked, I've asked parents to, I'd like to see the presentation before we do it, but if we're doing the 20th, we might even be able to see it collectively in the board and the committee meeting the week before, number one. Number two, I, I know you're probably doing a lot of the finance 101 education piece, okay? But I'm hoping we're going way beyond that this time to address some of the points that he's talking about. Right. So my list of things that I would hope to see in there, um, I would want to see something on this um, uh, expansion stuff that we're seeing with all the new subdivisions. What I want to do is I want to make sure that when they pick up the Daily Herald, which I'm sure is the first paper that they do pick up in this area, right? And they see this stuff, it kind of, Jobs are memory, and they say, Oh, yeah, I saw that the other night in Finance 101. Okay, so when they see something that says detachments, we want them to relate that back. Um, <clears throat> when they see something on new subdivisions, so both of those, we got a you know, one page each, just give them the punchline on that. All right, and I'd like to phrase both of those in terms of what there could be detachments, so what, so we can give them the impact. Okay, and then um, let's see, I can't remember. Oh, so I think you're doing the long-term finance projections. I know you guys have talked about that. Um, I think we should do a slide each on these pending legislation things. So one would be the pension cost shift, if that happened. Because yeah, you know, otherwise, you read the pickup paper and say pension cost shift. Yeah, that's really good news. Okay. And so we put it in the context of, well, let me tell you what that really means. And by the way, since we're not going to get any more revenue, that means we're probably going to need to make more cuts. Okay. Uh, this is our chance to really balance this equation here a little bit and say, well, here's what could happen and here's what it's going to be. And, and the only other thing I'll add to that is, it's been a year and a half now, but still the easiest, simplest, but accurate explanation of the reserve. That's a good question. That's a good point. <laughs> what the reserve is, what the reserve, how we came to the reserve, what the planning projections of the district has been over not just the last couple of years, several years, which has been, had to be adapted and changed because of the state situation and other factors. But I think that's, again, I think, again, we got to make sure the facts are on the table about what that is. We funded one key capital project, that's all, it's the pool. That's what it was agreed to. But understanding what the implications of that are, along with the other budget projections, not only you know, for the next year, 2018, but over the next three years plus. So I think that's that's a key fact that people understand what are the dollars that we are sitting on and how do we plan on using them and just making sure that as clear as can possibly be. Yeah. Well, what are we keeping for, you know, what do we want to keep as a reserve moving forward? Well, I think that's also understanding and also make sure the public and everybody understands the recommendations we get from the state about how much you should keep you know, as it relates to having on hand for things that are unforeseen. Yeah. So that's why the second thing, so one was the pension cost shift. That was actually the easy one. 
the other one is the um, frozen taxes. Okay, because if the frozen taxes happen, it certainly, you know, we need to make sure people understand what that means. Because it really does sound wonderful. I mean, gosh, it sounds great. Okay, but, um, you know, that, that, there would, are that, that would definitely have some implications. So I think we should talk at the next meeting on, you know, what we believe we can communicate to people, at least in terms of what that might mean. Now, I know we're not making any decisions, but I think we need to put it in the context of various scenarios. I mean, if you went two years in a row with no property tax increase versus a 2% increase on, what, $80 million, $90 million, 2% of nine, that's about $2 million a year, you're 4 million, and you're 4 million more in the hole than we're already planning, which is already too big a hole. So you're in double figures, it's more than double figures. You're more than 10 million in the hole, I think, coming out of the property tax freeze. So that's a lot of guts. Okay. So we won't, I think we need to. You know, like that's you know, just all we need to play the We don't need to play doom and gloom. We just need to make sure people understand. You know, when you pick up the Daily Herald and say property taxes are frozen, right? Your first sip of coffee, you can say, "Hooray, we finally got a property tax freeze," and then you got to deal with the reality. Okay. That probably rewrote a lot of your presentation. But, and, and, and let me know how I can help. I'm willing to help put a couple slides together because I don't want to see I don't want to see ten pages on on any one of those issues. I think it's one page. Here's here's what's going to happen, and here's what it means. Okay. But I can if you want to divvy those up and throw me a few, I can certainly help. Okay. Great. Okay. Anything else? On <clears throat> okay. I'm almost finished with the superintendent's report. Uh, D one two eight Renaissance great to greater. Um, you know, when we have, Peter, can you move us up to, you know, a few weeks ago we talked about the mission of the district, and we think it's very important really to go back and continue to spend time with this. And then, Peter, the next slide. Uh, one more, keep going. Okay, so the next two slides, if you want to jump up to the next one then. Okay, so, and now you can come back to AP just so people know what we're talking about again. Um, so you want to go one back again, Peter? Thanks. So <coughs> that story is a phenomenal story. It is phenomenal. Okay, you would be hard pressed to find another district like us in the entire United States that's shown those kind of increases over the last 12 to 15 years. It but, is it it is phenomenal. Okay. But what should we do with that? Yeah, show sure, sure. Yeah, that's nice cool. one. We have a well, mission. 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 what's our mission and then where do we go from there? <laughs> So what's, what we want to do is we want to spend some time. That has not happened by chance, okay? We didn't all wake up one day and our kids just did better, you know, the next year. We had smarter kids next year than we had the year before. We have had, there has been a, a series of plans and planning and work that has gone into this, you know, going back a couple of administrations. I mean, you know, my reference would be Dave, of course, before that would be that, Gossip. Uh, moving forward, but this has been a continuum over a period of time. The last 12 years, it's been on steroids, literally, and the results show that. So how did we get here? So over the next few board meetings, okay, I want to take a few minutes of each meeting, talk a little bit about the mission statement, review that very quickly again, and then talk about some of the pieces that have been uh, critical mass in terms of allowing our students to succeed at higher levels. Um, because it hasn't happened by chance. And we know that internally. We know how we've worked on that. We know how, the expectations we've had, the accountability model that we've had in place, uh, what we hold ourselves, um, the standard we hold ourselves to um, moving forward. But there are a lot of moving pieces that go into that, okay? So uh, I'll take a couple of pieces of each uh, of that bigger picture over the next um, you know, few meetings and we'll talk about that. Uh, because it's important to share that. I've been asked by a number of my colleagues, um, you know, kind of in the area and around the state, you know, how do, how do you guys manage to do that? And there's a story there. And I use, I use rather than using Jim Collins as, you know, good to great, which is kind of a legendary management leadership book, uh, it's really, our story is really great to greater. Um, and uh, there is a story there, and there is, um, you know, a number of factors that have gone into that. We want to highlight some of those things uh, moving forward. So uh, just wanted to give you a heads up on that. Uh, in the future, we'll still have our education, educational presentations that uh, Rita pulls in for us because we think those are very important. 
but it's also important for us to take a look back at how we got here and how are we going to continue to move the district forward uh, in the future beyond the time that any of us may be sitting, you know, at this very table. Um, so that's uh, that. Thanks, Peter. I think you can shut her down now. Um, as a board will note, we had five, uh, we had five FOIA requests uh, since the last meeting, uh, and we've got a couple of uh, donation acknowledgments that we'd like to go through tonight. So uh, first donation, we'd like to thank Mr. and Mrs. James Sayer. Uh, they have donated uh, the following items to Applied Tech Department at Libertyville High School. Uh, back in October, a Toro lawnmower and a home light power washer. Uh, we extend our appreciation for uh, their consideration and donation to our fine high school. Um, this is uh, Mr. Mr. Keith, Mr. and Mrs. Keith Steffens. This letter, um, I want to verify that they donated a 2005 Corolla Matrix automobile uh, to Vernon Hills High School um, on, in December. This was a free will donation. Uh, this will be used at the Vernon Hills High School campus by the automotive tech classes, which I'm sure Kip is really happy about, John, and will be jumped once it is of no further use. So again, um, our appreciation of Mr. and Mrs. Um, Steffens moving forward. Um, Semi-annual close rear minutes, Pat asked before, uh, we're recommending at this point after reviewing our semi-annual review that we don't release uh, any of the closed minutes at this time. Um, if you can uh, occur with that, um, then um, I'll need a motion uh, that we don't need to go into closed session, uh, that you accept our recommendation not to release any of the minutes. If you'd like to discuss uh, any or all of the minutes, uh, we will go into closed session after the meeting and do so and then make a decision from there. I make a motion that the closed session must stay closed for the time being. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Arthur. Aye. Nelly Collie. Aye. Rudy. Aye. Lundstedt. Aye. Luce. Aye. Mauer. Aye. Okay, so Pat, we won't need a closed session for that. And I have okay. one more thing under other tonight. We are, um, you know, excitedly and um, sadly. Um, well into the mix of uh, the LHS principal recruitment interview and recommendation process, uh, which began at what is the optimum time for recruiting principals in the state of Illinois, which is right around uh, December, January, uh, after the, all the superintendents have been picked and principals who applied for superintendencies didn't get those jobs and they may be looking for other positions. Uh, that's the optimum point. The position was uh, posted throughout the state from December 7th. Uh, to January 11th, uh, we've had an interview planning committee who's been working um, on the actual uh, at building interview. Um, we also have uh, interview committee uh, who's working on developing uh, questions for the candidate at the building. Uh, we've been doing back work uh, at the district office level in terms of screening uh, applications materials, uh, doing screening interviews, initial reference checks uh, for strong candidates. Um, and notification to candidates for um, further screening uh, moving forward and uh, the actual interviews for uh, the finalists that make it to that stage at the building um, will be uh, sometime in early February um, and then uh, the candidates uh, interview team teams uh, if we have multiple candidates will um, you know provide me with their feedback um, we'll do final interviews at district office and then we hope to bring a recommendation to you on February 27th with March 20 as an alternate. So that process is um, moving right along. Um, I do want to point out to the board, you've heard me say this many times over the year, talking about pieces that are important to our continued success in the district, we will not settle here. So if we don't get somebody that, you know, can step into Marina's shoes and, and take the building you know, to the next level, which is what we'll be looking for, then we'll be going out looking for. Um, you know, we're not going to take somebody in any of our leadership positions um, that, that cannot step into that position and take the part of the organization they're working with to the next level. So, uh, and on the sad part of it, we have to think about Marina leaving at the end of the year after the phenomenal job that she has done at Liberty Hill High School over a number of years. Uh, now, but Marina would be the first one to say that the next person that comes in, she would expect, is going to take the building forward and kids are going to succeed um, at a higher level and Marina will do everything in her power and transition uh, with the new uh, principal coming in. Um, so uh, that's the status. Uh, Yasmin uh, is also retiring at the end of the year. Um, in the next few uh, couple of weeks, her position will be posted. We have a similar 
uh, timeline and process that we use for that position will position well in that market. And you, as you might imagine, a uh, number of Yasmin's colleagues have expressed some initial interest in the position, knowing that Yasmin is going to retire. Um, coming forward, uh, it's a great district to work at. Uh, be a great place for somebody to apply um, their trade and uh, immediately kind of overlapping uh, with uh, Yasmin's um, toward the end of her posting, we will post Al's position is also retiring at the end of the year. Very critical position as the Chief Operating Officer uh, of the district. So um, we hope to bring those in February, March, and April uh, moving forward as we work through the process. So we're excited, um, you know, again, on one hand, to get into that process and all those processes, um, see what's out there and who the new people we're going to work with are going to be. Um, and uh, again, sad at the same time that we're going to lose three, you know, really skilled veterans of the district who have done some, you know, really phenomenal work here. So um, that's the update on that. So Pat, believe it or not, that is the superintendent's report. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. Let's see. Now what else do we have to do, right? Yeah. Uh, you're welcome to stay as long as you want, or. Yeah, if you want to go. You're, you're the last standing. Oh, Just yeah. in case okay. it's lengthy. You don't have to. No, you're welcome to stay. Okay. To yeah. <laughs> we don't want to talk in a meeting. I'm not sure how this is going to go. Emily likes hanging. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. So we are open for public comment. If there's anybody from the public who'd like to speak, if I could ask you to recite your name and address for the record, and then please try to keep your comments to about three minutes. Tim Anderson, 821 Bartlett Terrace, Libertyville. First thing is quickly note that this building was built 18 years ago for a capacity of 1650. You actually have 1650 student lockers built 18 years ago for book bags and coats. 1650 represents 80% of the real capacity. Capacity is 80% because there's so much movement through the building, you can't have every classroom used at the same time. So according to your demographer, 28 years after the school was built, we'll be seven students more here than what we built for 28 years earlier. And we've even added to this building since in the last 18 years. So you have no problem if the demographer is correct, you got that made. Next thing is, we talked about the Finance 101 what was discussed in November was how you would market it. It is important for the public to know about this. It was discussed at the committee meeting at the district office, the idea of sending out postcards on this Financial 101 to every property taxpayer in the district. So I've heard of the one date on the 20th, and you want to coordinate some dates on the in March, but the question is, what is the marketing program to get the attendance? Scott addressed that. But we notice the audience isn't that large. We don't know how many people watch this on camera. So it's important that the public know. A lot of people showed up two weeks ago at the Civic Center because the paper wrote extensive stories about what was happening in regards to the development out on Butterfield Road. So if we're serious about educating the public, we must do everything to market that conversation to the public. So hopefully we will hear later on on that matter. The other issue is I was one of the FOIA requests and I received my FOIA request response today. Two parts. One of my FOIA requests was I wish to see the letter that Pat held up at the last board meeting showing that Yasmin Data was going to retire and he made the comment is this was the first time he knew about it, which troubled me. So I mentioned at the F and F meeting that her contract says she has to send the letter to the board. When I received a copy of the letter that she submitted, it was to Dr. Lee. It was not to the board. The board did not know. Pat Mitt held up the letter. First time he'd seen it. So the question is, it was out of compliance. The contract is from the board, signed by the board, and it's in the contract, and board is always bold and capitalized. So the letter to Dr. Lee saying I'm going to resign in a couple of years isn't, doesn't work. That's not the requirement of her contract. So therefore you have a serious question of 
when you gave that six month extension as I addressed last time, did in fact, you turn around and for six months, create a $67,000 severance bonus that wasn't earned by her contract. That's for you to deal with. The next thing was on the sprinklers. It was mentioned at the board meeting, which has been on tape, and then Russell's story about the sprinkler heads at Vernon Hills High School. And Russell's story said it was $201,000. That struck me funny because in reviewing the minutes of all the board meetings from 2013 forward, there was no mention of replacing sprinkler heads or the board voting on that until May 23rd of 2016. In my request, I asked for, as referred to in the paper and at Pat's thing, that phase one and phase two were done in 2015. 2015, um, you did it with $24,982. Now to remind the public, the district office, so the business office can spend $25,000 without board approval. So the board did not know about phase one and phase two. So phase one and phase two was done at 23,890 and then 24,892 in 2015. The board had no knowledge in the letter, and I invite the board to receive a copy of what I received. Board, look at what I received because the contractor made it very clear that these were replacement sprinklers. The contractor knew of the issue and so did the business office. The board did not know there was a recall. The contractor was a recall, it's in his letter. That's why he's graced to get the business. But when you ask someone to complete the whole school, you do it as one bid and then you can break it out as to how you want to implement it due to scheduling time. What is clear from this one in 2015, it was a partial done. I'm going to suggest flat out, there is every reason to believe there was collusion between the business office and the Hill Sprinkler Company to make sure the bids came in below $25,000. So the board would not know that sprinkler heads were being replaced. That's a serious statement I'm making. And I'm making it very clear for the public to know about this. The board has to start addressing this issue. So the whole sprinkler thing, and then in 2016, when you approved on May 23rd, 127, what you didn't know is two months earlier, without needing for your approval, another $23,800 was spent. So they knew it was going to be somewhere around $200,000. <clears> they just couldn't delay letting you know about it until you voted on May 16th. So three bids went out just under the $25,000 threshold. And I believe that was done so the board would not know that this sprinkler issue was being come because I think there's a certain amount of embarrassment of having to replace sprinklers that could have been done for free if they had been done during that six month, uh, that six year window from 2001 to 2007. So it's time for the board to get involved. The board reads your packets. Any FOIA request that anyone makes, it should be a standard policy of the board that any response the district makes to a FOIA request that response is completely copied to every board member. You should know what these responses are to these FOIA requests. Don't just say that they were answered. Know what they're answering, because people are asking questions. You should know what they're asking for. We'll let the chips fall where they may. Thank you. My name is Casey Rooney. I am a Libertyville resident, parent of two LHS grads, and a junior at LHS. First of all, I want to thank you, Prentice, for taking the time tonight to go through the demographic study as well as the detachments. I, I feel like I learned a lot tonight. <laughs> I was one of the many residents who packed the Village Hall in November and in January. And I want to thank Scott for reaching out to me and, and talking to me about some of my concerns in terms of the district's involvement in those developments and the numbers. Um, I respectfully ask that you just revisit with your experts so that they, they do know there's 17 homes behind Dairy Dream, 20, I think 26 townhomes at Bolander that are under construction, 148 homes planned on the Butterfield development, potentially 120 mixed apartments, townhomes, et cetera, at the Trim property. 
some of those numbers seemed a little bit low to me. I, I certainly will defer to experts, but let's just make sure because five, seven years out, I think 41 is a low number. Just saying. <laughs> Um, the other thing I'm, I'm hoping you can help me with a little challenge that I've had, and I realize that I'm a small subset of people who will attend this meeting as well as the village meetings, but um, they seem to be on the same nights. I've had, like tonight, there is a village meeting going on talking about the development behind Dairy Dream, near and dear to a good friend of mine's heart. I would love to be there to support her, but I wanted to come here. Um, I don't know who decides that or how that process happens. But it does seem like your meetings are the same time as all the Libertyville Village meetings. And with all of the developments and things going on in Libertyville, I do think that you'd maybe see some more people here uh, if there weren't so many people passionate about moving the needle on some of those developments. So anyways, thank you for your time. And one little side note, I'm very sad to see Dr. Scott go. She's handed diplomas to two of my kids and I was Kind of hoping we'd stick around for one more, but <laughs> but I want to she thank you does. for yeah. <laughs> we try. I want to thank you for your time and your efforts and all the wonderful things you've done for LHS. I thank you too, brother. Thank you. You've been a pleasure to work with. So, thank you. Thanks for the time. Hi, I'm uh, Tom Forrester uh, from Libertyville. Got a daughter who graduated from LHS and a son who hopefully will graduate from uh, Vernon Hills here. Um, generally speaking, you know, I think the schools are great. I think you guys do a great job and whatnot. Um, I do have one issue though. Uh, I think that the, the idea of putting boys and girls showers in locker rooms and girls in boys showers in locker rooms, I think is ridiculous. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm going to have to deal with that this semester, as my son tells me, there's two girls in his uh, gym class, and while they haven't headed into the locker rooms yet, when, uh, when the swimming uh, unit comes up or the kayaking unit comes up, uh, we're going to be forced to deal with that. Uh, and, and I think, first off, I think it's, it's an egregious policy. Um, you know, year, hundreds of years, um, you know, we've separated boys and girls, and now we're throwing them in on a whim. Um, parents weren't sought, uh, their, their ideas weren't sought on this. Um, in fact, you know, this kind of changed very abruptly. And I'm not sure why um, the district thinks that they know more than hundreds of years of parents um, separating uh, the, gen the sexes like that. Um, I'd also say that uh, you know, if you were a doctor and you took the Hippocratic Oath, you know, the first thing is don't do any harm. And I'm not sure that you're helping either side here. I mean, I, I think there should be a lot of compassion on transgender kids. I mean, they, I wouldn't wish that on, on anybody. Um, and I'm sure that their psychological issues are, are vast and, and it deserves compassion. I don't think that this, uh, uh, this policy does either. Um, you know, most uh, the studies show that between 70 and 85% of transgender kids actually end up switching over to their um, biological uh, sex by the time they reach full maturity. So a lot of these kids, you're kind of locking them into you know, years of frustration. Um, so as far as the transgender kids, I don't think you're helping them at all. I think you're hurting most of them. As far as the um, regular kids uh, you know, who, are, who are fine with their sex, their biological sex, um, I, I can tell you that my, my son and his friends uh, are all concerned about this. Um, they feel uncomfortable with the idea. Uh, they, feel, they certainly rightfully feel uncomfortable both changing in the locker room um, with these girls in there and taking showers, uh, if that's what's called upon um, with these girls in there. I think one, it's ridiculous. I think it's a very poor policy. Um, and one that I, I think that the, um, the school rushed into. Um, is, to my knowledge, we weren't being sued by the Department of Education. We weren't being sued by the Department of Justice. Um, so there's really no need for it until that time. Um, also, um, basically, the, the heads of the Department of Justice, the Department of Education that put in, you know, these ideas, you know, are gone now. Um, Sessions and um, <coughs> Betsy DeVos will, will, look, will for sure be changing this. Um, and I certainly hope that once this changes, you know, from the federal level, that the board gets rid of that policy. I think it's awful. Um, you know, I, I did uh, speak with somebody at District 211 um, who's going through a lawsuit on this, and so far I think they're... Uh, the, the legal costs on, on just uh, on that lawsuit is 170,000, and they haven't even gotten a decision on a temporary injunction. So that hasn't even really gone to the court yet. Um, 
And I, I will say even Stephen Breyer, uh, one of the liberal justices on the Supreme Court, um, put a stay on a similar policy in Virginia until they could hear the course, court, or until they could hear the case. I mean, so here's even a liberal judge that says, no, we're going to hold off on this thing. Um, but Libertyville and Vernon Hills went ahead with that. And I just think you guys really jumped the gun, and it wasn't something that you should have done. And as far as, you know, not um, doing any harm, I think you're har harming both the transgender person and for the, the, the normal biological people. I think you're hurting both sides. And I would hope certainly, one, that you guys would reconsider and change this. Um, two, uh, once the policies change in Washington, I hope you would get rid of it immediately. Um, uh, and three, um, I will just say if lawsuits do need to come, um, there's probably a good chance that uh, the, the superintendent, the assistant superintendent have personal liability on this because <coughs> their knowledge of it uh, and it was their policy that went in. So I, I hope um, cooler minds uh, uh, prevail and I hope you guys get rid of that policy. Thank you. My name is Jerry Verbain, I live at 319 Carriage Hill Circle in Libertyville. I've got a couple questions, more than I have uh, statements. Um, uh, I know you talked about various areas that, that are wanting to come into the Libertyville, uh, Vernon Hills District 128, and all the school systems. Um, and, and we know why. We know that it's because of the quality of education. And, you know, I have a good friend of mine who's a retired uh, superintendent who uh, has always said to me, he said, you want good schools, you've got good principals. And so that, I take my hat off to you because uh, we're going to miss you. Um, but in terms of they wanting to come in, is it possible to develop a poison pill? You want to come in? Pay us $25 million. No, it's not here. Why not? Because it's not part of the statute. But can we recommend it to be? If we're having them all coming to us, can we do something in that realm? Uh, no, we can't. Okay. Well, I'm going to be talking to our legislators because it just, uh, you know, it doesn't appear to be fair. Correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, something's wrong. Um, you know, your, your person who does your demographic studies, I'm hoping they're considering a dynamic that's currently happening here. Number one, um, corporate transfers are way down, way down. And corporations are, are not transferring their employees around the country. And, you know, we've got some pretty high-tech corporations in and around here. And if you look at Abbott, AbbVie, Baxter, and I go on and on, you know, there was an awful lot of influx into the Libertyville, Vernon Hills area um, and buying some pretty nice homes. Because corporate transfers, um, they're generally transferring the top of the top of the shelf. In addition to that, I mean, there's some dollars associated with transfers. So that's not what it used to be. In fact, I'll tell you that in many cases it's drying up. That'll have an impact on... Uh, on the growth. You know, the other thing, um, uh, and I've said this before and you've heard me before, in the area of a home value inside Libertyville or Vernon Hills of six to eight hundred thousand dollars and even more, um, there's a point of diminishing return now because what you said uh, was, well, Younger families are looking to buy these homes. It's not true. No, they're buying small homes. That's right. I know, that's what I said. That is what I said. Okay, I'm sorry I missed you. But the point is, I agree with you from that standpoint because quite honestly, when they're looking at homes now at uh, 700,000, 800,000, 600,000, they're looking at it and saying, holy moly, I've got to spend $20,000 in taxes before I pay dollar one on my mortgage. Sorry, young family, I can't afford that. And they're not coming in like that. So my, my, my concern and my message is make sure you're contributing those factors because it is having an influence. Now, 
The other side of the coin, if you take somebody with a $400,000 home, they're selling. You're exactly right. They're selling. And you know why they're selling? Because that was so told me, we're getting a hell of a deal here. Because guess what? I am spending roughly $11,000 a year, and 73% of it is the schools, and that's 7,000 and change. And boy, I'm spending seven grand to educate my kids in some of the best school systems in the country. That's a bargain. And that's the way some of these young people are looking at. And that's why we don't get a lot of cooperation. We don't get a lot of people coming in here. They know they got it good. But if you take a look at somebody like me and so many people in our community, you're 65 and older, you know, you want to talk about a freeze? Pat, I think the best freeze in the world would be to say, hey, we'll cap taxes to people 65 and older in Libertyville and Vernon Hills at $10,000 max for schools. Is that fair? Well, you know me, I mean, and people that are living in a six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollar home, I'm paying a lot more than that. To me, it's a tax break, and I'm still paying my fair share, ten grand a year, right? I'm going to propose that. I'm going to see what, see if it flies. I mean, our boys down uh, in the state always want to free something. Let's try that. But the people then that are getting the quote-unquote bargains, okay, I'm going to tell you what, I'll make you bet they're going to become far more interested in school board meetings and the money spent to educate their kids. So that's a message, you know, pontificating, I guess, huh? Um, when we go into the uh, sessions associated with, you know, training the public, make, make sure, if you want to win the people, make sure that the message is delivered that good school systems are pushed and are uh, revolving around good parenting. And make sure that the parents, because I'm telling you what, you can tell it a lot of success, but you got a lot of good support from parents in both school districts, and they make good schools. So, thank you. All right, thank you. Anybody else? Uh, good evening, my name is Kevin Huber. I live at 1012 Ashley Lane in Libertyville, Illinois. Uh, 1986 graduate of Libertyville High School. Uh, I think that would have made me a 78 graduate, maybe a Butterfield or 80 graduate of Butterfield. And back then it went through eighth grade. So first off, I want to thank all of you for your tireless hours. Being a board member is never easy. It seems there's a lot of criticism, never a lot of compliments. So first and foremost, thank you for everything you do. Uh, I have a couple points I'd like to make. And first off, if I can help you in School Finance 101, I would greatly like to do so. I used to run the Chicago Teachers Pension Fund. I'm an expert in pensions, and as Dr. Lee pointed out, that is the train that's coming down the tunnel. And it's a dark tunnel. And I'm not so sure that Dr. Lee and I agree with everything that's going on with the dissertation he gave you about what's going on in Springfield, and he and I can talk about that later, and we will do so. But the pensions is a big deal. Secondly, I'm also chairman of the Illinois Student Assistance Commission, and that chairmanship gives me a position on the Illinois Board of Higher Education. You all know what's going on with higher ed in the state of Illinois. I'd like to encourage you, I was reading uh, the meeting materials before I arrived, and I noticed that you're going to be passing in your consent agenda awarding contracts to most of your administrators if they don't already have contracts. There was a big red section. I believe red means it's, it's a change. You can correct me later if I'm wrong. I'm not so sure why we are awarding contracts in a state that is an employment at will state. It's my 
history is running a pension fund, working in governments for KPMG, being chairman of the Illinois State Assistance Commission. The contracts favor employees. If the employees are great, they don't need a contract. So again, I encourage you during your review of the consent agenda to consider that, potentially table that, talk about it further. Certainly Dr. Lee, his position, the contract, no question about it. Other positions, and again, I'm not so sure the number of contracts that Libertyville and Vernon Hills has. I'd be interested in that information and perhaps I'll FOIA it. But I suspect the results will be, in my opinion, a few too many. Let me end with, again, thank you all very much most of the time you get criticized instead of complimented. You do a fantastic job. So thank you all. Hello. Uh, my name is Sydney Maud. I live in Grays Lake, Illinois. I was a graduate of LHS in 2014. I'm currently attending CLC. The reason that I'm here right now is I'm actually pursuing a degree in education, and one of the requirements of my class is to attend a board meeting. So I just have a question for clarification. Now coming here, I thought that you guys would talk more about the budget, which obviously didn't happen. So the meeting on February 20th, is that, that's an open meeting to the public, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, there, you will be talking more about like budget issues and things mm -hmm. pertaining to that as well. And then, do you have a location for that at the time? The district office. First one will be a district office right across the street. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Anna Dre. I live at 1020 Ashley Lane. Um, I've got a couple of things I'd like to visit with y'all about tonight. First off, the principal search. Thank you so much, Prentice, for updating us on that because a lot of folks have been wondering. That's Dr. Scott leaving tremendously huge shoes to, to fill at our at well, our high school. Anna, what we were actually trying to do is is you know hope Maria would just stay with it. You know, it didn't, it didn't work. So around December, we actually had to look for a principal. So good luck with that, Prentice. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> So um, I, I'm glad to hear that you've got a formal process and that you're, you're doing a search. A couple of things. Um, that is, I would say your two principals, not to make light of your position, Prentice, because it's hugely important, as well as the school board, those are such key, pivotal positions. Three, you get a bad principal and, and you've got a huge problem in the school. In the school. I think that position is important enough that I wonder why you guys are only searching within the state. Um, I, I wonder why we're not doing a broader search. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb here and, and say that um, I know that there's a strong internal candidate. Um, I think there's concerns about that candidate. Um, I, would, I would urge you guys to look further. Um, I think there's concerns amongst the parents. I think there's concerns amongst the staff, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, I, I, I really hope you all do a, a very comprehensive search for the principal. Um, I hope you're incorporating teacher and parent input into this decision. Are they are they on the search committee? They will be part of the interview team. Okay, awesome. Um, and I would encourage you when you're looking for parent input, go beyond parent cats. When I was a freshman parent in 2009, there was a tremendous amount of participation in parent cats. Not so much anymore. I would put it out to your to your parent population at the high school and and have people put names in, see who's interested, and then and then draw from those names. And if you're going to be proposing a candidate February 20th, oh, so. then no time like the present to get the parents involved. Um, I'm pleased to hear you guys talk um, talk about the the impact of the of the different developments in Libertyville um, because we have been wondering. I came to you in November and expressed concern about you guys getting on the field. Dr. Schumacher's been to a couple of the planning meetings right now, um, which is the first step to this going forward and this happening. And we hadn't heard from, from District 128, and I agree with Scott, I think there's been some accurate information, I think there's been some inaccurate information out there. Nature pours a vacuum, so I love seeing y'all fill that vacuum with, 
with, uh, with accurate information. A couple of things, when you discussed the analysis, y'all talked about Bolander and the Archdiocese property, and as Casey pointed out, the South Butterfield property, which right now the Village Hall is full. Uh, they've got a very, very full meeting going on over there right now. And the Trims property is, between those two, that's an, an additional 159 units. That's a lot of, uh, a lot of extra homes. So you, you guys mentioned you've already um, accounted for 202. It's almost half of them that you guys aren't, don't have in your figures. No, a lot of those are apartments, but you're still going to get students out of there. Um, the other thing I, uh, I wanted to visit with you guys about was something that Casey had mentioned as well. I think something really cool is happening in Libertyville. We've been, um, for lack of a better term, we've been kind of a fat and happy little village. We've elected good people for the board, for the village, and we've kind of set back. Well, there's been a lot of things going on, and it's woken people up, and people are really starting to participate, and that's great. And there was a large discussion today on, on preserved Libertyville property rights about, well, who's going to which meeting? Who's going to the village? Who's going here? Because there's issues at both that need represent, representing. How unfortunate that as stakeholders we have to make those choices. And I don't think it's necessary. I'm going to give you the same challenge that I've given Terry Wepler, the mayor of Libertyville, that I've given Guy Schumacher, the district superintendent for 70. Y'all need to get your meetings off the same nights. If I was a parent in District 70 still, right now I'd have to choose where do I go. If you want to go represent me at the planning meeting for these developments, you'd have to choose between attending your own meeting and representing us at the village meeting. I'd love to tell you all how to fix that. I, I don't really know how. What I do know is you, Terry, and Guy need to sit at a table and figure out how to get your meetings off of the same nights. Now, I went ahead and I looked. You guys are the fourth Monday. Planning is the second and the fourth Monday in the village. Um, District 70 is the fourth Monday. So everything, the fourth Monday, you, you can be at meetings every fourth Monday. In Vernon Hills, um, their, um, their village meeting is the first and the third Monday, and their planning is any Wednesday possible. It, I think those are the schedules y'all need to look at for the village meetings, the planning meetings for the village, because those are important meetings for your citizens to be attending. And see if y'all come up with something where we're not having to, to decide which, which one to attend. Um, and the last thing I wanted to leave you with, I wanted to thank you guys for being a, a leader on the progressive bathroom policies in District 128. I know that doesn't make you very popular with uh, some people. Um, it may not affect many children, but the ones it does affect, boy, it affects them profoundly. And um, my son will have no problem with the policy. Thank you guys for being a leader on that. All right, thank you. Anybody else? Okay, let me just, uh, I just want to make some minor um, re responses just to set a few things straight. Just one on the, <clears throat> on the sprinklers, just to clarify, and Tim, you and I just probably need to align on this. Um, <clears throat> according to um, the Illinois School Code, so it's section 105 ILCS 5 slash 10 dash 20, with respect to contracts, the cutoff is $25,000 unless it is, and I'll read it directly, a contract for repair, maintenance, remodeling, renovation, or construction um, <clears throat> or a single project involving expenditure not to exceed $50,000, okay? So it is higher for construction projects, all right? Now, <clears throat> at the end of the day, I've said it before, I'm going to say it one more time. We could have handled this differently. Um, number one, we could have taken advantage of the recall. We've been through that before. We did not. Um, I think we've done all we need to do to look back on that and make changes in a number of places to take care of that. Um, yeah, in the future on things that are not really a single project, but could be perceived as a single project, we probably want to handle that differently as well, okay? But I'm going to go on record and say there was no conspiracy here, because we've handled it differently. Yes, okay, but we are not going to address that issue anymore unless we have new information, okay? Now, related to that, I do want to correct. Um, in the consent vote agenda, we will accept the minutes from the last meeting, um, which very accurately reflected the statement that I made. But my statement was in error. Uh, and I want to correct it in these minutes, if we could, just to make sure the record's right. So phase one was correct, phase two was correct. My statement last month was that phase three of the project was completed in the summer of 2016. Actually, phase three of the project was completed in the spring of 2016. And then, then following a review of the bid package by the board in May 2016, the final phase of the project was initiated and is planned for completion in 2017. 
we could just reflect that minor change in the minutes. That's consistent with the facts that was in open today. Okay? All right. <clears throat> Very briefly on the transgender issue, let me be clear. Uh, we did not operate on a whim. We don't do that. We didn't do that. Okay? We did not rush into it. Okay? We don't do that. We didn't do that. Um, this was really not a choice. Um, it was our actions and our policy was based on a detailed review by outside legal counsel um, who has studied the matter thoroughly. Um, it is consistent with our current interpretation of the law. If the law changes, um, I imagine that we will re-interpret uh, what the current legal situa situation is, but I, I don't want anybody to believe that this is some whim or some political thing or just something we thought would be kind of cool. Okay, that's just not how we do it, all right? Um, and I don't think there are, there are a few things more important to us in making sure we treat all of our students equally, period. Uh, last comment I'm gonna make is one should not assume that just because we don't show up and protest at public meetings that we do not have communications ongoing with other local government entities. We do, whether it's at the board level or through our various administrative functions. We're in constant communication with people on the Vernon Hills Village Board, people on Libertyville Village Boards, um, and so just because we're not showing up on TV and in, in big sessions, you know, I want to reassure everybody that, you know, we are out there and we're necessary, making sure that our, you know, other governmental colleagues are appropriately aware of the impact of things to our district and, and really what our point of view is, okay? One should not take lack of attendance as lack of interest and lack of involvement, all right? So, with that said, um, let's uh, move on to the consent vote agenda. Um, I will ask for a motion to approve these items. Can, um, I, can I ask a question yes. before we get sure. into this on the consent vote agenda? <coughs> there are some new names that are on this agenda that weren't on when we had committee meetings. Yep. Is it correct in my understanding is that those names are on there for retirement purposes? and that we are not voting on any contracts with the approval of the consent vote agenda. Is that an accurate statement? So the approval of the consent vote agenda, and to, to answer your question, these notifications were submitted since we had a committee meeting, number okay. one. Okay. Number two, what we are approving here is that they have notified us that they are going to retire. Okay. That does not necessarily require approval of a contract. Okay. Um, and so really what you're approving here is that they are, um, that they are retiring. Okay, just wanted to make sure that was clear. Okay. And, and Pat, but, maybe yeah. we should add that um, availing themselves of benefits that are currently in their, you know, existing agreements or have been promised as part of their agreement. Yeah, so said differently, if their existing contract has language in it with respect to retirement, such notification would essentially trigger those elements of the contract. Thank you. Understood. Pretty straightforward. Yeah. There's already a previously approved contract. Right. Correct. Pretty straightforward. Just wanted to make sure I understood that. Correct. Okay. Good question, Scott. Thank you. Okay. Um, and again, we're going to approve this with these minutes because those minutes were an yes, accurate right. statement of what was done, right? So and the changes I mentioned will actually just be reflected in those minutes. In other words, we don't, we don't need to amend those minutes because that's not how they're right. 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 Exactly. I just want to be clear on that. You, you just okay, so I, I can make motion as amendments. No, because we don't want to amend the minutes because those minutes reflected what I said. Okay. Okay. At the time, I and your, correct, your correction will be okay. reflected yes. in this. Yes. Okay. All right. So is there a motion to approve the consent vote? Okay. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All right. All, uh, roll call, please. Delay Powell. Aye. Gertie? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Luce? Aye. Mauer? Aye. Arthur. Aye. Okay, motion carries. Program personnel, or yeah, program personnel will change after chair personnel. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so first we have 22 policies up for revision. If you will remember from the last committee meeting, the vast majority of those policies uh, were being changed <laughs> to reflect vocabulary changes. We no longer have NCLB, we, we now have ESSA. We no longer have highly qualified, we have other terminology. Um, I have a sheet that um, outlines each, you know, each item and what it means, I left that at home. So I'm just gonna let you know that the majority of the policies um, do reflect changes in terminology. 
but not the intent, not structure of the policy, but policies themselves. Uh, a few other policies simply put into words practices that we already do. We have far more rigorous practices than the state law you know, is as it currently exists. And when the law catches up to our practices, then we put, we put the policy in place reflecting that. Um, we can either wait until next month and do another first reading when I can go over each one of these, or you can, it's still a first reading, you're just passing it as first reading, and it would be up for adoption a month from now. So and that's up to you. And if you have any questions, you can. And if you have questions, policy, you can certainly call me, email me, and I'm glad to. Should we still have for a second reading? Can you go through them all? So I can do that. We still have a chance to. Absolutely. Or maybe even provide you a, a summary of. of the I policies. have a summary that I made, I can, or that I made that we can provide you with. That would be helpful. Because it's a lot. Yeah, but it would be good to see okay. before we approve anything. I'd like to sure. I mean, the final approval. Right. Okay, so you can it. approve them as first reading, get the summary sheet, and then you can, if you're not comfortable, drop it off of the second. Okay. Sorry, I forgot that. It's, no. it's never good. Good detail. There's a lot of detail. Yeah. A lot of them it seemed like they just rewrote the same words that they said, actually. They did. They crossed it out, and then they wrote the same thing. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. <laughs> It appeared to me. It appeared to me that they went to an active voice rather than a passive voice. Yes, yeah. there was a lot of stuff. Like so like the third time, an English teacher got involved. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> correct. Yeah, actually, there's a lot of things that you can do that you get more money than what you're looking at. Well, thank you for sparing us. <laughs> <laughs> This is I think if no this child left behind doesn't exist, we really ought to change yeah, those things. Course, yeah. And make it current, you know. We ought to make the vocabulary current. Right. Not just every proposition, but. Okay, so you're okay with first reading, and then we'll bring it back for a second reading. So then I need a motion for a to approve the first reading for the board policy. Uh, no. 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 I don't. Oh, okay. I'll have a first reading. Sorry. First. Okay, then, all right, then we move on to uh, part B, educational tour requests. We've got two, two requests for field trips, one to Washington, D.C., one to Urbana, Illinois. Looking for motion to approve those. I move to approve the educational tour request assistant. Second. Any discussion? Roll call. Gertie? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Luce? Aye. Mauer? Aye. Arthur? Aye. Kelly Tong? Aye. Libertyville High School, the math team going to the same competition? Yeah. So they're both bucking for number one and number two in state again. I think they're, are they at a different division? Yeah. Yeah. Are, are they different divisions? Yeah. Report. <coughs> they, every once in a while they have the same, but it's not the same as the two of the year. Yeah. It adds and flows. I, yeah. We're the same, so I don't yeah. know if she's moving. <laughs> I think we stay low because it's 2,000. It's it seems like that middle, percent. yeah, that kind of the middle of yeah. the population. Mm -hmm. We could go either way, but we've got two, we've got two awesome math teams two at our two high well, schools. By the way, it, wa it wasn't mentioned in, in, in the student activities, but I do want to go out and say that both Vernon Hills High School and Libertyville High School will be downstate at the dance competition in two way. Friday and Saturday in Illinois. State. That was mentioned. Yeah. Did you mention it? Yeah. Uh -huh. Then I don't listen and I stand. Scott, <laughs> so you may not want to go home today though when your daughter yeah. watches the video of this. So. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure she'll. She'll be glad you mentioned it again. Yeah. Yeah. You just got to Want to go out there? It's great for both schools. Yes. Yeah. Cut that part out. We'll expect streaming video. Well, um, no, because Emily will go. Hey, she, you will go tell her I did not listen to you and brought it up in the meeting. So. I'm already doomed because of her, so. Okay. Did we use some of finance? Yeah, facility and finance uh, helps. Okay, we'll, we'll start off with. Uh, yeah, I'll explain it back down. Oh, sure, I'm going to swallow this. Uh, we'll start off with construction managers uh, selection is the uh, topic, but uh, in December the board approved uh, funds for uh, a pool at Libertyville, and that triggered our uh, effort to finalize and, and select a uh, construction manager for that effort. Just a little bit of history. We, I think at Yasmin, we, about a dozen people were uh, considered and uh, we distilled that down to what we call semi-finalists, about five of them. And of those, we got a first round of interview by eight representatives of the district, got us down to uh, finally two people or two groups. And uh, we recently had follow-up interviews for that. And uh, Yasmin, I'd like you to just highlight some of the 
things we thought about and considered, and uh, we'll, we'll then come to our conclusion. As we look at the number of uh, firms that have expressed some interest, it was uh, you know, kind of difficult to narrow it down, so we looked at what the criteria should be. Um, initially, when we started the process, it was the entire project. Um, so we highlighted firms that had worked on lavatoriums, gymnasiums, and reconfiguration of existing spaces. As we got further into the uh, uh, discussion with the board and we narrowed it down just to the pool at LHS, we looked more closely at firms that had worked exclusively on uh, pools. Um, with that in mind, um, we interviewed two firms, uh, Turner and Gilbane. Um, we met with representatives, not only just the team members, but also the leadership that was going to oversee the project and spent a considerable amount of time with them talking about a, the experience, the experience of the team members. Uh, we looked at if they had the true expertise in building this very specialized uh, uh, for us. Um, and then obviously we called their references and uh, we asked not only of the facility people, we asked of the business officials too what they felt of the firm, how responsive they were to some of the questions they may have had how close they were to the budgeting process, whether they stayed within the guidelines that were presented or given to them, and um, you know whether in the end they were totally satisfied with the project and if there were open issues, how they were handled. Once again, the references came back very positive for both of those firms, so it became very difficult for us uh, without going into deep discussion as to which firm we should select. Um, that kind of brought us to uh, looking at firm, of the two firms, what firm had done projects that were close to us in Lake County, so that we would know that A, they had the connections here with the right vendors, with the right uh, providers for the kind of services that we were looking for. Uh, we looked to see who the team members would be and how recently had they worked on a project similar to ours. Um, we also uh, look to see where they were uh, as far as the leadership, how, um, what the tenure of the leadership was in the firm. Uh, so that we knew that we would get consist consistency in what we were looking for. And um, with Alex and Mark and myself being in the final group, we discussed who we should recommend to you tonight. And we're coming to you with a recommendation uh, for Gilbane as our construction management uh, team. We provided you with a little bit of information about both the teams. Uh, we gave you some information on the cost analysis, and obviously we're looking for some approval from you tonight so we can move forward with the actual contract negotiations with this particular service provider. So as Yasmin said, uh, both firms were, were very qualified, and it, it was a, a tough decision, but uh, as we looked at all the local uh, projects that Gilbane did, we. we tended to, to migrate toward them. So that's what we're recommending tonight, that the board uh, approve them as construction manager. And we got feedback on them from the local areas that they did the work with. Yeah. Yes, we did. In fact, uh, a local group has been calling me or sending me emails on a very regular basis reminding me that they have worked on pools around here and we should really use the services for it. But um, you know, this is once again going to be a project that is going to be bid out. So we not only have to look at the low bidder, but we also have to look at the most responsible bidder. <coughs> and, uh, quality. We want to make sure that, obviously, that one of the key things that we're also going to look at is um, the safety record. We do not want people on the site who may get hurt, or we may don't want anybody who's going to leave a site open so that you know there is vandalism or anything like that. And we talked in detail, too, with our uh, finalists about it, as to how they would handle something that is so close to a school that is going to be in attendance close to 22 hours um, you know, of the day. And, and, and both companies were, were stellar in that regard with regarding their answers and their practices. So uh, no, no issue with that. It really came down to uh, their experience and their knowledge of local uh, terrain and, and working environment. Can you remind me, if, um, I'm maybe remembering this wrong, but- Karen, can you play my Oh, sorry, sure. Was there an issue, did this, did Gilbane do both Highland Park and they did, and what, one of them had a problem, right? 
We did talk to them in great detail about word on the street that there were some uh -huh. issues with it, and the feedback that we got was it had more to do with, correct me here, Mark, um, some of the site issues that were there, some of the designing that was there that perhaps, you know, Gilding itself was not responsible for, yeah. but other uh, groups were. Uh, in the end, um, the feedback that we've gotten is that they're very happy with the pools that they have. I mean, did we go and talk to Highland Park and Deerfield? And it's, okay. Yes, we talked to both. Well, we're, I would we're assume really, you might have even been there. At the yes, time. we're we're really fortunate because Mark, uh, as as you as the board knows, most of you know, and the community does know. But before we were able to get Mark to come to 128, he was at 113. So I just want to make sure we right now all due district. diligence. You you feel comfortable based off of what you knew about it and everything else. Yes, I I did visit the Deerfield site. Um, at completion. Um, actually, I didn't get a chance to visit the Highland Park one completion. I was able to go by. Um, uh, it, they just opened it up uh, this last weekend, I believe. Um, but we've talked to people in well, the we've talked, I've talked to swim coaches, talked to building managers, um, talked to the district. Because there's a person in my position uh, at 113, and um, everybody is very happy with the services that were provided by Gilbane. And there were there were some design flaws, uh, but they weren't. Um, there was engineering um, um, on the. Um, I won't name any groups, but um, just from what I heard from conversations, uh, um, and they. Um, so I guess the they problems. could guide us, having lived through that. They having lived through that, they'd be able to guide us through any decisions we need to make. And Mark, they didn't use the same pool design group there, right? Uh, no, we actually we chose a different uh, pool consultant than they did at 113. We did interview their pool consultant, and we decided to go with uh, uh, Councilman Hunsaker. So, Mark, did you you worked with them at the Deerfield pool though? Is that while you were still there? Uh, no, I, I actually I was a building manager at Hall Park gotcha. before okay. I came. Oh, back. Okay. But, but I did walk through the the site. And it happened after you. Yeah. 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 The process started yeah. just um, when I left. And yes, is um, the client reference on that one? Is that, is that your husband? I'm sorry. There's a client reference here. Is that is that your husband? Uh, yes, but I did not ask him about that. Okay, <laughs> just that caught that. Because the construction hadn't started there, okay. they did not pass a referendum. So yes. And where? What project was? I didn't see that on here. What project? Um, they were looking for. Um, to redo a number of schools. So uh, the references that I talked to were um, District 113 here. Mm -hmm. And uh, at 125, I spoke to actually the previous business manager as well as the current business manager. Uh, I tried to reach somebody at Joliet. I was unable to do that. Uh, and John Hicho at Captain uh, Deer Falls was somebody I know very well. Uh, so in fact, both 113 and 125 gave me a lot of uh, other things that I should be looking at, not so much Gil Baines. It said, hey, when you're doing a construction project, keep this in mind, keep that in mind, because they were so satisfied with the services they got. And just for clarification, uh, are we voting just to pick this group as our moving forward and doing bidding with them, or are we approving almost a $1.6 million contract with them. It is both because one goes hand in hand with the other. If you choose to hire Gil Bain, obviously the cost associated with the contract is there. But the thing that still needs to happen, Stephen, is that um, we don't have a contract with them. So obviously, uh, you know, the standard contract is an AIA contract. But what we will do is um, we will make some modifications to those contracts and then we will give it to a liability insurance attorney right, who will look it over and recommend some changes that we need to make to it, if any, especially as they deal with subrogation. Because uh, you know, if something happens, we don't want to take the liability on, although we are going to carry a risk, uh, uh, builder's risk policy. Uh, we still want, if there's anything that will happen, that it's their liability carrier who will uh, take it over as opposed to ours. That is going to be a really key focus on the 
So can I answer your question? So are we, yes, one more little follow up. Yeah. So is this a not to exceed this number that we see here, or are we talking Are you talking this about the fees that are reflected here? Right. Right. Uh, there are some that are estimated numbers, for instance, the reimbursable cost, you know. It could be around that number. That's the estimate based on their experience. We're also looking at the general cleaning <coughs> and other things that are here. Those are estimated numbers. But Some of the back, others. The specific question is: the motion tonight is to specifically yeah. approve what? To approve the to um, retaining Gilbane as the construction manager and giving us the authority to go ahead and negotiate a contract with them with that we'll bring to you, and those numbers okay. will be in So that's all we're doing then. tonight. So this You're is basically just giving them, giving them permission to go, go finalize a contract with Gilbane. That's correct. Not to approve the final contract with Gilbane. We will bring that to you yeah. next so month. There we go. That's what I thought you were asking. That's what, that's what I wasn't asking. sure we got there. So I asked them. I asked Yasmin to quantify everything so that we, even though it said it's 1.5% of construction costs, I said, well, what, what right now do we know about construction costs? And we took that 1.5% and quantified it so we could get a number. So, uh, you know, we're, we're, not, we're not trying to go after a low bidder here, but we wanted you to know uh, on top of everything else what one was charging versus the other. Yeah. And, and that's, that, has to, that will be refined because there are percentages in there and there are estimates of what they've done on many, many jobs and all that going to come into focus as we uh, go down. But down really, track. again, tonight all you're saying is can we go ahead and finish this and deal with the right? That's correct. And then correct. when you do finish the deal, you're going to come back and say, here's the deal. Here's the we will give you a copy of the contract yeah. for you to approve at the yeah. February board meeting. But one thing we would like is on Friday, we are starting our <coughs> um, team meetings again. Yeah. Uh, we're looking at the design concept, we're looking at value engineering, and we would like to have Gil Bain on the table yeah, with us so we can move forward with this. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, what's the timing to finish the contract? I want to put this in the context of the new board. Well, Alex, you want to answer that because you asked questions about it? Yeah, I don't remember the answer, but I, I, I don't remember the month. About months, uh, one we were looking at October. Uh, no, 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 you're talking about the construction. So contract. when will we see the, uh, the Gil Bain contract? I would like to do it so that you have it for approval in February. Okay, so, so nice. I want to keep it moving. Yeah. Okay. The, the thing that's why I didn't know because I was talking about construction and we we've been talking about this for six or nine months and that did while well, we were wanted things started by uh, September 2018. That's a that could be a slip because uh, just because of what we you know, the delay we the hit we took and uh, both, both seem pretty optimistic about getting it for the uh, beginning of 19 and, and the, the possibilities of a uh, earlier but you know we're we're not interested in pushing it. Once once we know it's slipped, we want to make sure it's done right. We want to make sure we that Mark and his crew get in there and can shake it down and, and then be going into 19 with it. Okay, so, yeah. All right. Can I have one more follow-up? Yes. Just as part of, two, of the due diligence, we did look at the safety records of these companies? Yes. Okay. We asked each of our references if they had any issues regarding that. Um, and very honestly, all of them were very, very frank with us. They did, if they had an issue, they talked about it and said, this is how it was handled. So, um, did you see how many OSHA citations? Did, they, did you review how many OSHA citations they took? That we did not, but if you like it, yeah, certainly yes. Yeah. But we saw those, yes, you asked. we saw those when we were first looking at everything. That was a part of that's true. the OSHA citation. That's true. Really um, any other questions? All right, so okay. we need so, a motion. Um, can I make a motion that we approve Gilbane as the contract to be, uh, approve Yasmin to go and negotiate the contract with Gilbane? Second. Any discussion? I just have one more point. I just, I just want to thank you for your service on this. I'm looking around this table and, and I'm seeing two fewer engineers come the end of April. And I've always thought it was a hallmark of this group that we were so balanced from a, from a skills perspective. And um, I mean, I get a better chance than now to say we're going to miss that. I feel a lot more comfortable making this decision because no offense to you, Mark, um, or you guys, but most of my attention has been on you. So um, that is a real, that's going to be a real loss for us. Really, from a personal point of view, having Alex <coughs> on the team with us, uh, really Yeah, no, it's, I've always felt a lot better knowing that he was there because I know this is. Now, there's also, you guys, you've been through that many times. There's also an open item, obviously, that the board needs to discuss is the uh, 
uh, hiring of a owner's rep for the project. Maybe in February we can start okay. discussing. Let's bring that to committee and get that in discussion since we're moving from the construction manager. Yeah. Okay, can I say one more thing before we leave um, construction? There is a misconception, apparently, in some segments of, of the community in the northern part of the district. Well, hang on one second. Is it part of the motion or not part of the motion? Oh, I'm sorry. You yeah, got to finish, finish that. that. Sorry. Back. All right, so, step so on there is a motion to approve going forward to negotiate the negotiated contract with Gilbane. It's been seconded. We've had some discussion. Any further discussion? If not, roll call, please. Lundstedt. Aye. Luce. Aye. Mauer. Aye. Arthur. Aye. Delicoli. Aye. Gertie. Aye. No. Okay, thanks, Pat. Sorry, I got ahead of myself. It's been a long meeting tonight. Um, just uh, to make sure, again, uh, for the public, uh, the board went through almost a three year process of looking at major capital needs. Okay, certainly, number one on that list was the potential replacement of Glory Hall High School pool. Number two on that list was the addition of a second gym, not a new gym, like taking the old gym down and building a new gym at uh, Vernon Hills High School. And the third piece of that major capital projects was looking down the road at repurposing the current LHS pool <coughs> and built the new LHS pool. So there seems to be con some confusion, uh, at least among a few people um, in our communities that um, the board is moving ahead with building a brand new gym at Vernon Hills High School. So just for review, Okay, after a long process, the board determined that yes, in fact, there was a need to replace the pool at Libertyville High School. They also determined, okay, through presentations and data, that there was a need for a second gym at Vernon Hills High School. Okay, and they determined that eventually we will need to do something to do something to repurpose the pool at Libertyville High School. Okay, they decided, given the finances of the district, the uncertainty of the state and our current reserves that um, they would allocate and use reserves for the pool at Libertyville High School. And given, given our updated uh, district finances and our projections moving forward, okay, it was determined to place the Vernon Hills pool on hold, yeah. or gym, uh, on hold. Um, until such time we came back and revisited that, which logically would probably be when we start to think about <coughs> repurposing the old pool at Libertyville High School, and that will be subject to the financial conditions of the district uh, moving forward. So just wanted to say that again for the record, um, you know, so everyone understands what the lay of the land is um, in, in terms of what we've done and where we're at right now on capital projects. And that's why we're moving forward with all of the requirements to, to do this moving forward at Libertyville. Okay? Okay. Good. Okay. We have one more item. Uh, the uh, approval of a new uh, student activity bus for the state contract. Who, who's got that one? I've got that one. Uh, it is recommended that the Board of Education approve purchase of a new 2017-14 passenger multifunction school activity bus uh, from Southern Bus and Mobility uh, of Breeze, Illinois, in the amount of $45,517 through the Illinois State Bid Contract Program. Uh, this cost represents the base price offered through the state a contract of $46,800 plus options and less a trade-in value of $4,500 for the 2005 uh, student activity bus at Vernon Hills High School. A um, little background, um, Vernon Hills High School has four activity buses, the oldest of which is a, a 2005 and we like to replace it because of its age. Um, and then our next um, oldest in the fleet between both schools will be a 2009. Okay. All right. So motion approved. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Roll call. Lou? Aye. Mauer? Aye. Arthur? Aye. 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 Gritty? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. All right, motion carries. Anything else? No, unless anybody has any, any other, uh, that concludes the facilities finance committee. All right, no property, no seat, all, no IASB. Um, so can I have a motion to convene an executive session? As I mentioned at the beginning, um, we have two items. 
One is a matter relating to individual student, 5 ILCS 120 slash 10 and another is um, employment of employees, 5 ILCS 120 slash 2C1. I move to go into the second Yeah, we're not going to do anything coming up. All right. Uh, do we have a second? All right, 